Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Don't worry, I've been produced. All right. Yeah. Is it better? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, Shabbat Shalom and Wei Gak. As you are aware, the Shabbat again, but as you make it close, Kaya and Ovesem, or Kitnak or Baba Sinziri, per by Metzutzaze. And there it is. That's the extent of the Armenian I know. I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's Thursday night. Like you know, I'm sure there's lots of other things to uh, also be doing, but frankly, this is the one thing I would rather be doing with my time. And I'm glad that you're here to share this with me. This is a little different than, I know some of you have seen me speak before, this is a little bit different than what I usually speak about, but it does combine some of the same elements. And uh, you could say that my lectures and the lectures I've been giving have pretty much been a kind of work in progress. And those of you that have caught a few of the lectures have seen, or the presentations have seen, that the message has kind of evolved, well, because I've been thinking about this more and more as time has gone on. So, think of this, what I'm going to talk about right now, as a TV show pilot, or the first movie, you know, when they do seven Star Wars movies, they'll do the first one. And the first one will have 12 different new characters in it and a whole bunch of other things. So basically, there's a lot of information coming at you. So I'm going to keep it very simple. I don't want to confuse people with bombarding you with all the different aspects of what it is I'm going to talk about today. But this is something that I think in our culture we need to have a discussion about because we no longer can pretend that what's happening with technology and entertainment is not going to touch us. It is going to touch you. It's touching you yourself individually. You in your own lifetime have seen some amazing technological advances just in your own lifetime. You're sitting there looking at music playing from tape to tape, reel to reel, or uh, maybe you remember your uh, parents had a phonograph that they used to put on with and people used to sit there listening to the radio and then pretty soon there were LPs and then there were 8-track um, uh, tapes and then cassette tapes and then DVDs and CDs, well CDs, and then DVDs. And then you could only go to a store and rent the DVDs. And then all of a sudden now they're streaming. You don't even want to buy a DVD anymore, except for my DVD, which is back there. <laughs> Gosh, can not go to sales. Like this, things have gone really fast and they're getting even faster. I can't even keep up. I don't know how you guys do it. I can't even keep up. And I'm in a technological industry. And I, and I believe that as now being a father, having two children myself, I think there are certain things that I started to really think about. Certain things that are so important for us to talk about as a culture that we don't talk about. It's one of the issues people in general have now, but especially in our culture. In our culture, there's things that are just understood. You don't really talk about them. You don't get into them. You don't talk to the next generation about certain things that are going to affect them or harm them or enrich their lives. We just assume somebody somewhere is going to do it. And I guess that's one of the other reasons I want to talk about this, because I believe that after having spent over 20 years in the film industry as a visual effects guy, but also as a filmmaker, I've seen trends and I've seen things and I've seen the way people, what's the good word, manipulate? And I don't mean that they get up in the morning and say I'm going to be evil and manipulate people. No, people have to make a living. Executives have to make a living. Advertising executives have to make a living. Film executives have to make a living. So what do they do? They want to know what you like. They want to know what you think. And now with modern technology, with that very thing that all of you carry with you, which is the cell phone and getting online just right now, and I'm going to go through and look at Amazon, or I'm going to look at websites, and they're tracking you. You can get specific software to stop them from doing that, but most people don't, especially younger people. Everybody's being tracked. Everybody's being absorbed into the matrix, into the system. They know what you like. Because every time you go on a website and you look at something, and you check something out, then you start on your Facebook seeing all these ads. Like, how do they know? All of a sudden, I'm getting all these ads about things that I looked at Amazon just the other day. Yeah, it's all interlinked. So, as I talk about, as I said, getting into these lectures, and eventually, maybe there'll be another lecture down the line, or maybe there'll be a video that I'll do, or something like that. But I, I want you guys to know that you're in the inaugural period of this group of talks that I'm going to give. 
So you can help me out here. You can tell me what was successful and what wasn't, what I could change, what was boring, what was exciting. Because I think that this is an important message. And frankly, I would like to go around and tell people about this. I think it's important enough for our current generation. We're, all, we're a part of this. It doesn't matter. I don't care how old you are or young you are. We're all part of this. I'm actually older than I look. So I'm, I'm a good place. I'm in between everybody. So this is basically a pilot. In a previous presentation, I talked about my East of Byzantium project. That was one of the talks I had. I think it was at Abril. I got up and talked about it. This, when my first book was published, the first graphic novel, I spoke over there. Because basically, a graphic novel is a serious comic book. Some of you that were uh, raised in other countries, Lebanon and so on, they had Asterix, Tintin, things like that. Those are all graphic novels. Basically, a graphic novel is one complete story in comic book form in a book. And usually, the topic is either entertaining or serious. Sometimes it's journalistic. Sometimes somebody's talking about what happened with the Palestinians, but they do a very serious graphic novel, and it's noticed. They get prizes for it. It's like a political document. Sometimes it's pure entertainment. It's part of a series. Sometimes they'll take a bunch of comic books, which I'm sure some of us grew up reading, put it all together, and they'll call that a graphic novel. It's a marketing technique. It's basically sequential art. It's a comic book. And I know about sequential art because that's the first thing I started doing in the film industry. I did storyboards. So I'll show you guys some examples of all this stuff that I'm talking about. So let's get into it. Okay. All right. Can I have the light off so we can actually see things clearly? So you guys can all see that? I need that one. That's it. That'll work. You guys can all see that? Okay. Like I said, this is, if you want to think about my lecture today, my little presentation, as it were, I don't think this is a scholarly presentation. This is just somebody who does something which I think is pretty cool in the industry. I mean, share it with you. But uh, recently there was a movie, Captain America Civil War, which is kind of interesting think about it. At this point in the United States history and in world history, you see what's going on. Suddenly they're doing a superhero movie where the superheroes are fighting each other. It's a civil war. The story existed before, but the fact that this movie would be released now and do really, really well. I think they've done about a billion dollars worldwide. That's a billion dollars with a big B. And they're going to do more. Marvel Comics is owned by Disney. Disney owns Star Wars as well. Disney is a giant. Disney is a monster. Disney is very good at this. They also own Pixar. Disney knows what your kids like and your grandkids like. And when you were growing up, they knew what you liked, but they, now they know it even better. So does Marvel. These are all characters that they made years and years ago, but now they're making movies out of them because they know movies are the art form of our century. But now movies are going to be replaced, and I'll tell you about this a little bit more by other forms of entertainment, which are going to be even more absorbing, which are more captivating, and more reality distorting. So this is my lecture. It's got a lot of facts. It's got a lot of characters. People are, it's very confusing. I'll try and keep it simple. But it's the pilot, the pilot of the talk. There's many different topics we're going to talk about. Why am I qualified to talk about this? Let me stress it again. I've been doing this for quite a while, over 20 years. If you guys want to check out my work and see actually what I've done, it's actually very, very difficult to find it. RogerCoupalion.com. I hope you can remember that. Okay? RogerCoupalion.com. And over there you'll see my visual effects work, you'll see my personal work, you'll see some of the graphic novel work, there'll be lots of video clips. And I'm going to show you some of those clips today. You can also go to all the various uh, Facebook pages we have. One of them is for the East of Byzantium project, which is the Vardanan story that um, is depicted in the graphic novels. So we have a page for that, a Facebook page for that, which has over 20,000 fans now and uh, growing. I think that's a pretty good accomplishment, considering it's an independent small project. It's uh, quite exciting. And 
here's another one of my credentials. Not only am I in the film industry, but my major was not art, actually, even though I've done art from, since I was a kid. My major is an English lit major. My major is an English lit, and it was at Cal Poly Pomona. Okay? You guys recognize that building from Cal Poly, right? When you're driving, you know, on the 57. What's interesting is that building is used in all these movies. And one of the movies that they use this building, because it looks futuristic in, was a movie called Imposter, which I actually ended up working on. So I'm watching this movie that I'm working on going, oh my god, that's my school. Mm -hmm. All right. So I thought that was pretty funny. Another thing that uh, qualifies me is the fact that um, uh, I thought I was going to end up being an uh, investigative, creative journalist and make documentaries. Even before I got into film, I was in Narapat in 1994, right before the Zinatata, right before they, they called it off. And I made my first independent project called Dark Forest in the Mountains. Okay, and um, so I obviously have from my family's side and the way I was raised, obviously I have a very strong sense of identity. Now I'm not up here to just talk about myself. I just want you guys to understand where I'm coming from. That's actually why I'm talking about all this. Some of you know this about me. So the year after I go and, uh, you know, sit in the middle of being shot at in uh, Rarapa, the year after that, I get my first visual effects gig, and that's working on Space Jam. That's the one where Michael Jordan and Bugs Bunny are in the same movie together. A lot of people who are about 20 to 25 right now remember that very well, because that's the movie they grew up with. And at the time when I was working on this movie, which was the first one, it was a place called Cinecite in Hollywood, owned by Kodak, um, people kind of thought this movie wasn't that good. So they were like, you know, but now it suddenly became really popular because of all the kids. That was my first film. And one of the most famous films I've worked on, including this image, is from Lord of the Rings, the trilogy. While I was down in New Zealand working on Lord of the Rings trilogy, I met people in New Zealand that are uh, what we call uh, medievalists. They're reenactors. They, on the weekends, they dress up in armor, they go out, they hit each other. And they ride horses, and they know how people lived in the Middle Ages or the Roman period, and so on and so forth. So, what you have is the beginning of the East of Byzantium project, because I wanted to see what people would have looked like, what they would have been wearing, how they would have fought during the Vartanans period. Because it's a story, the Vartan period is something that's very important to me. And while I was down in New Zealand working for this big project, The Lord of the Rings, as an Armenian, I'm already thinking about my own identity, my own culture, and the way that I could grab my culture and bring it back and kind of claim it is to start working on something like this. And by the way, the first people that started working on this with me, Han Chen, Hai Chen, they're New Zealanders. New Zealanders were the first people to work on Lord of the Rings, the Vartan project. And they were very excited. So we created the helmets, people that designed swords and armor, you know, on the side. You know, of course it's on the side, what I mean is. So on the side they created things and we were able to shoot a lot of footage. And I came back and presented the footage. And then things started rolling forward, uh, actually. And uh, the bottom right is us shooting similar sequences in Armenia. Not a couple of years ago. So now, all of a sudden, the project has pretty much scan, spanned the globe. And uh, the man who set that up is sitting in this room, my brother Armin. Raise your hand. He's our Armenia producer. So I told Armin that, you know, we, have, uh, we got funded, we got some investment. It's not a lot, but we need, to make, uh, we need to make it count. So he said, you can actually get more bang for the buck in Armenia. I would have shot the whole project in Armenia if I could have, but obviously we were dealing with a family situation then, so I couldn't do that. But we were able to go for a few weeks at a time and shoot whatever we wanted. We shot at Garni, we shot all these other places, and it's so easy to shoot in Armenia. Wasik Mechkunas, these get us, you know, with their costumes and actors and people, and then you go to this place like, let's say, what was it, Ashtarak? Was that one of the places we went to, with a bridge? And you just go to the guy and, you know, my brother had set it up, but we just walk up and we're like, okay, listen, we want to shoot here this afternoon. There's a nice little river, we got the bridge, we got this. Okay, how much? 50 bucks. Okay, great. And I'll give you some apples, too. Fantastic. 
So we're just like sitting there shooting this, and it was a very organic experience because everything I do for the film industry is all planned out. There's so much money involved. You know how it is. Whatever project you work on, that's big. You need lots of plans. There's always people overseeing. But this was something that was heartfelt. The group was so together, and we said, you know, let's just shoot this part of our project right here, and we did it. And there was a young guy who was helping us, who was a refugee from Syria, Surya Hai. And from the back, he looked just like our character who was playing the Dirta Takavor over here. So I said, you know, can we shoot you from the back doing blah, blah, blah. So we just kept improvising. It was amazing because Armenia sort of felt like it was the land that was saying, you can make this film here. But there's something spiritual and crazy about all that experience. It's like one of the directors I've worked with, you might have heard of him, Clint Eastwood. Uh, one thing that he likes to do one thing he doesn't like to do is do more than three takes. You know, when they do the camera, ready, action. He doesn't like doing that more than three times. He figures out that if you can't get it in three takes, you're not going to get it. So his movies always come in under budget and ahead of schedule because of that. It's like jazz. You just have to improvise a little bit. You have to feel it. And that's the approach we took here. Obviously, that whole effort with creating the East of Byzantium project because of all the images and costumes and the story, I said, you know what, it takes a while to create a project on film. It takes a long time. Some of these Hollywood films that you're looking at, like Gladiator, took 10 years. By the time the director said, you know, I want to make this movie too. And this is a big guy. That was Ridley Scott, okay? So we knew it was going to take us some time to do this and I said you know what I want the story to get out there before then I want young people to be able to open this but not just young people but yourself included to open these books and visually understand and feel the story the Gregory Illuminator story and the Barthanov story that 150 year cycle which is one of the most pivotal cycles in Armenian history not the only ones but definitely one of the most important Okay, we were discussing Moses Korenazi and, and, and how he wrote about all this. Well, we've got to tell the story in a way that the young generation finds exciting. And frankly, I wanted to tell the story in a way I found exciting. Because this is my industry, this is what I do, and so that's where these books came from. So obviously, I wanted to present Armenians in a more heroic context as well, having grown up in, in uh, learning about our history. I did some other projects with uh, Serge Tankian, the top one, which has gotten more than a few million views now is uh, his uh, music video for Honking Antelope. Again, my brother and I had a company called Fugitive Studios. We did some very ambitious animation for the budget, and uh, it's, it's quite popular. But I want you to look at the image below. You see that Native American guy with a kid? Okay. I actually did, for one of his songs, and Serge was into this, I did, the theme was, as you know, Native Americans also in this country went through genocide. And I said, as Armenians, we can't just be always talking about our genocide and our pain. That's very self-centered, and I think you've got to reach out, and you've got to be showing other people that, yes, we understand what you're going through because of what we went through. So I said, what if I take it, Armenian genocide as an analogy in the music video, and we did it for the Native Americans. It's actually a true story based on a true person but I don't think people quite <laughs> understood what I was getting at, uh, because I think people just want basic information. But it actually is a very, very beautiful piece if you have a chance to look at it. So here we get to the nitty gritty. This is my cultural background. Obviously, I'm Armenian, but I didn't grow up in Lebanon. I didn't grow up in Fresno. I didn't grow up in Glendale until I was 12, and, or Hayastan, or Iran. My family, we lived in Sierra Leone, West Africa. And you can see that we live in a multicultural group. That's me on the left. Okay, little kind of, you can kind of tell. The Armenian kid on the left there. You can see our classroom is very mixed. I grew up with all kinds of different people, and I had the opportunity as an Armenian to gauge my cultural identity against people that were not like me. Kids today growing up in Glendale, don't exactly have that. They're growing up in a very comfortable environment. They go to an Armenian summer camp, they go to Armenian youth groups, and so on. Sure, they encounter kids, you know, in, in high school or whatever, but they have so much of a base to pull from. And every April 24, you know, there's a lot of us go down to the, the embassy, and the, the march, and 
you know, people don't go to school, they skip school and all that good stuff. So here it's more readily available. And I think because it's readily available, you tell me this. What do people feel about things that are free? If you had something you didn't have to pay anything for, how much would you value it? You get. I'm sorry, go on. For granted. You take for granted. That's right. Something that's free has no value. If you paid something for that, either sacrifice or hardship or funds or something, you would value it more. You want to you do it. It's like some of you, maybe you put your kid in like karate or something growing up or, you know, because you paid money for that kid to go, you make sure that kid goes. We want to get our money's worth. But what if those classes were free and you could go anytime you want? Hardly anyone would go. It'd be few. So, this is my point. Growing up in Sierra Leone, I really saw the value in my culture, and I saw it from a very different perspective than other people do see it. It wasn't terrible. People didn't hate armies. They just didn't understand who we were. They kept mixing us up with Lebanese and Syrians. And my dad made sure that we all knew the story of Kachvartan and uh, High MBS, high MBS, and all that good stuff. This is this is in Africa, guys. This is like maybe maybe we had like ten Armenians in the whole country. That's one probably one of the things that I really owe my dad. He did his job, and I'm sure a lot of you did too, raising your kids. I'm sure you did your job. Your kids have a strong sense of identity. I've gone around different places and presented different topics. At Abril, in Spain, in the Canary Islands, at Comic-Con, I've talked about my projects, I've talked about the Vartan story, and I've talked about the graphic novels. So, after all that, we led into the title of my talk, which is My Run-In with Truth. Because I know that there was a title to this story about lying, the war of truth, about lies. When I talk about lies, I'm not talking about someone who's a charlatan who knows something is a lie and is just trying to get your money. That's not what I'm talking about. That's not what this talk is about. And I'm not pointing my finger at anything you believe or don't believe about the world. I'm sure you've really given it a lot of thought. Let's step away from that right now. Let's just talk about the idea that as cultures, we are having some serious issues with understanding what is true and what is not true. And we're also having a serious disconnection from intrinsic truths. Because there's a revolution that took place. Every home has a computer, and all of you have probably used computers in this room. It doesn't matter, and I think most people. And now you have one in your hand, it's called a smartphone. There's more computing power in that smartphone than the spaceships that took people to the moon. And it's growing exponentially. I know because every year there's new equipment and new items to use, and I see what they're doing with entertainment. Entertainment is probably one of the most technologically demanding fields out there because now they're working on different ways not only to give you, bring you movies fast through your phone, whatever, but also virtual reality. We'll get into that. Reality is about to change big time. Reality is about to shift. How many of you guys have seen those glasses people are wearing now? The virtual reality goggles. They put them on and people are like, walking around. I've actually put that on and painted in real 3D space. Someone watching the screen, if, if I'm just standing here, I'll just be, you know, he's like, Ish Astadon, what is he doing? <laughs> but on the screen, you would see what I'm actually painting, and it's being painted in real 3D space. I actually painted the armor of Vartan, and actually could step inside it and wear it. That's just one of the things. There's some people doing some amazing things with it. This is just the beginning. Imagine surgeons using virtual reality to operate, shrinking themselves down to like almost microscopic size virtually to be able to form these delicate tasks. That's just one thing. Manufacture of, of all these like nano machines and, and, and uh, even, you know, applied to engineering and architecture. Not just entertainment. Entertainment is using this. And the military is using this. And the military is using entertainment. Everybody's starting to use everybody else's technology. It's all coalescing together. They're finding value. The military is looking at video games and looking at movies and saying, we want to use this. This is part of our propaganda machine. This is what we need. 
to present our, and also the tools we need to wage war. But we are also, on the, on the peaceful sector, we're also using what they're developing. But let's talk about the arts, which is basically my expertise. I, I don't want to talk about things that I'm not an expert in. But I'm an expert, I believe, in the arts. And this is from the person who wrote V for Vendetta. He is quite a colorful character. He's actually a, uh, he's actually a real uh, practicing wizard. <laughs> he's also a well-known writer, Alan Moore. He wrote V for Vendetta, he, he wrote Watchmen, and they've, they've made them all those into movies. These are also very um, important graphic novels. He said, artists use lies to tell the truth. Yes, I created a lie, but because you believed it, you found something true about yourself. Think about that for a second. Art is always lying to you. Always, but it's also always telling you the truth. If it's good art, if it's something that's going to touch you, it is honest. Actors are not deceiving you. They are being honest. They really have to believe they are these people. How many of you guys watch House of Cards on Netflix? Uh, Alright, look, you know what? Name me a movie you've seen that you've really liked. Gladiator. Gladiator. Russell Crowe, right? Okay. Give me another movie with some good acting, something that just made you walk out of the theater. Godfather. Godfather. Wolf of Wall Street. Yes, Wolf of Wall Street. What else? Come on, you guys saw movies growing up. Huh? Those guys don't want to talk to me. Something with Brigitte Bardot or... <laughs> I saw this crazy movie the other day. It's a black and white. Um, movie from the 50s. It's called uh, Sunset Boulevard. You guys ever see that? Oh my god, what a good movie! William Holden. Swanson. Yeah, Gloria Swanson. Crazy! You, I can't believe they made movies like that back then. See, this is the prejudice young people have. We don't think people back then were good at what they did. They're, they're amazing. And how long have movies been around at that time? Maybe 60 years in the 50s? They were making movies over here in Hollywood while they were massacring Armenians. There was a big movie industry. People were running around and film and bumping into each other. Everything was great. I'm, not, I'm just saying that. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that look at what was happening. Look at where movies come from, how old they are. And this is suddenly the most important uh, art form. You guys go to movies and you guys watch a movie and you walk away from the movie experiencing something that is like a religious experience. You can get mad at me because I said that. I'm only saying that as a metaphor. It's like a religious experience. It used to be you opened a book and read an amazing book and it was like a religious experience. You felt something. You walked away. You're like, this is amazing. I learned something about myself. And I couldn't put it down. I couldn't stop watching it. My brother and I saw Star Wars in 1978 in Serbia. It was maybe... <laughs> Ten people in the whole audience, because uh, Star Wars was released in 1977, but we missed it because we were in Beirut vacationing. We came back like, oh man. So the next year when it was released, my dad had the habit, he would take one of the workers, one of the drivers, because they had a lot of us ones, so he didn't care about Star Wars, so he we were in the theater. It was a double feature with Charles Bronson, Death Wish. So Charles Bronson is sitting there killing all these people, you know. Okay, that was fine. I mean, you know, back then, kids could go see movies like that, and it's in Africa. And people were smoking in the theater, and there's smoke everywhere. You know, there's one guy there, one guy there, we're here, our driver. And then, the reel shifted. We knew all about Star Wars, we'd read about it. What about Tripostino? <laughs> okay, that's another good one. But we knew about Star Wars, we'd read about it. We had the toys, I read the book, but nothing could prepare us for that first opening shot where you saw that planet, you saw that ship fly over you, our universe changed forever at that point. It changed everything. I'm sure you also had experiences like that growing up, where that one movie that you saw, first time you saw Brigitte Bardot, or first time you watched Charlie Chaplin, or first time you saw The Godfather, or whatever it is, you saw something, you read something that just changed your world, because as much as what is being written is fiction, it's also boiling with truths inside it. 
And I think today's generation, maybe, we tend to forget that. People are very dismissive, especially with religious faith, because they look at it and they say, well, it's all a bunch of BS. That's something that people are saying now a lot. So they miss the point entirely. They don't get the meaning behind something. There's also historical truth. We talked about artistic truth. There's also historical truth. As Armenians, we're very aware of history, and if you talk to people about, let's say, um, actually, the Ambassador John Evans's book, which I'm reading right now, about uh, how he was the new one, it was called. Truth held hostage. Yeah, truth held hostage. He's talking about Americans and history. Americans, he says, and Australians, and maybe three quarters of Canada don't really care about history. Ancient history is gone. It's the past. It's not just my critique. This is, Americans say that about ourselves in general. They don't care. Armenians care about history. Most of the world actually thinks about what happened in the past shows me the patterns of what could happen today. You know about the past. You know how people might act today. But in America, it's all the new, the forward. Let's look forward. And people like that are easily manipulated. You can make them forget things really easily. We just had 50 people get killed somewhere. And I was sitting there talking to my friends. I'm like, you know what the sad part of that is? As sad as it is what happened to those people? Even sadder, in two weeks, it'll be business as normal. And someone will come along and, you know, because people have a really bad sense of history, quick to disconnect, let's go on to the next thing. And as time goes on, it's getting even worse, especially with the young generation. So Napoleon said, history is a set of lies agreed upon. What's he talking about when he says that? What do you think he's talking about? Is he saying that everything in history is a lie? Everything Moses Koran Nazi wrote is a lie? Is that what he's saying? What do you think he's saying? What do you think he's saying? Well, if a great many people believe something, most everybody will follow. Okay. And you've also heard that uh, history is written by the victors? Not true, yeah. but they believe it, but not the truth. Yeah. But, but the history is also written by the victors, yeah. or we all agree on a version of history we prefer, because that helps us today. Let's believe this that happened. So if you look at um, American history as in the movies, you've heard people like argue that wasn't the way it happened. That hero never did that. that you know, Mel Gibson's. Uh, let me give you an example. Not even American history. How many of you guys saw Braveheart? Right? Probably one of the best cool Mel Gibson movies out there. Not true. It's not true because those people weren't even alive at the same time. One was a kid, but in the movie, you know, you know why they do that? You know why they do that. They've got two hours to tell a story. They don't have two seasons to tell a story. They don't have two years, 20 years to tell you that story. They've got two hours, and in two hours they've got to make their money, and they've got to excite you, and they've got to turn you on so you want to watch it. It's what works for the two hours. But you know what happens? A lot of people watch that, and they bo never bother learning about the actual history. Is that wrong? I don't know. I'm not judging that. I'm just saying that's, you know, that's the way it is. And there's also truth in current events. Unless you had your head totally in the sand in the month of April, you know exactly what happened. You know that Azerbaijan attacked. You know they planned this. It's so obvious. Forget I'm Armenian. Forget we're Armenians. Just, just looking at analytically. People who aren't even Armenians are saying this. It's so obvious they had this thing planned. What, three fronts? All those weapons? Things being flown in from... Okay. Let me give you an idea. See, this, because I was also studying to be in journalism, I know how, and because of my studies in English Lit and writing, I know how taking a word and putting it in front of another word, changing the sentence of the structure will change the meaning. Very subtly. Very subtly. If I write a paragraph a certain way, I can change the meaning of that whole event. And you wouldn't even know I did that. You'd have to be very, very, very careful to figure that out. You guys remember the news coverage during this time, right? You guys remember how frustrating it was to, to read some of those articles? written by third-party sources, by the BBC, by Reuters, even while the fighting was going on. Can somebody raise their hand and tell me what was the most frustrating thing about that? While Azerbaijan's attacking Armenia, the way people are reporting the news, what, what was it? 
please. Uh, it was pro-Azerbaijan. Okay. That we were the separatists mm. or something like Perfect. that. Perfect, yes. We were the separatists and yes. Azerbaijan was trying to get justice. Right. Separatists, that word is so loaded. <laughs> separatists. Because there's other people, groups in the world that maybe don't have as clear a history in terms of their claims. And so by keeping us with those people, your standard person reading it, oh, they're separatists. What other things? What else? That's a very good point. What else? Armenia was the aggressor. Armenia was the aggressor. What else? By saying Armenia was the aggressor, you could have said Armenia was the aggressor by just not mentioning that Azerbaijan was the aggressor. And here's another thing they did, if you guys noticed. Pretending to be even-handed, right? Oh, well, we don't know who really attacked first. Oh, I love that one. We don't know who attacked first. But they're fighting now, and, uh, you know, the uh, OSCE and Europe is saying, guys, calm down, please. Do you see how that is a complete manipulation of history? And it's a very subtle one. That's almost, and I'll use a good word here, satanic. Whether you believe in a real devil or not, that was devilish. It's something I would do if I wanted to manipulate something. I would come in and I would basically take a topic and I would leave certain facts out and present it in a certain way. Because then, I could get you to look at that topic differently. We do it all the time when we're writing screenplays. They do that in reality shows. There's no such thing as a reality show. It's all scripted. They do that. Let's show this shot of this person looking like this because it'll make you think this person was actually mad. If you go on set, they're all laughing. Okay, camera's rolling. All right, get serious. Okay, you're reacting. Donald Trump is firing you. Be sad. You're crying. Okay, later. Cut. Ha, 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 ha. We're all laughing again. But you know what? You didn't see that. You saw Donald Trump say to someone, you're fired, you saw how sad they were, it was very intense, it was very, like, you know, they built reality for you. They made you feel something, you felt for that person, Mehke. If you were sitting on set, it'd be business as usual. What I'm trying to say is that these people are really good at manipulating things in such a subtle way, it's not like a Turkish person saying, there was no genocide. Yeah. Would you say that Azerbaijan pre-planned the war and pre-planned the news that are going to be uh, distributed about the war? It sounds as if it sounds as if that was all pre-planned with money given to the newspaper owners to write their version of the story. Absolutely. Whereas we Armenians, being you know as we are at the present time, survivors of the genocide. Uh, don't have that kind of money or influence to buy things at the present time. And I, I think it's deeper than that. And I, agree, I agree with you. That is exactly what happened. Therefore, we suffer injustice, just like another genocide type injustice. It is an injustice that we suffered, but part of that we're doing to ourselves. And I'll tell you why. I'm not the person who likes to beat up the victim. And at this point, Armenians were, you know, it was just status quo. Obviously, Azerbaijan wanted to force the issue, and obviously, Azerbaijan has access and is hiring people to help them write the script. We'll do this, and then at some point, we'll declare a unilateral ceasefire if it doesn't go this way. If it doesn't, if it goes the other way, and we're taking tons of territory, then we'll do this. Yeah, it was all planned out. Armenians had their own strategy on how to deal with the invasion, but also, if you look at how they reacted and the amount of money that this is a whole other topic, but the amount of money that's being redirected to other things instead of buying. Uh, warning armaments and cameras and detection that, that we you can go down to Costco and buy it for your own house these guys don't have it on the front lines okay I mean part of that is we're doing it to ourselves but also part of that is as Armenians are so amazing they're, they're so good at strategically thinking analytically uh, chess masters you know but we're not applying that to our culture to our lives we're not proceeding forward from that we're very emotional but nothing wrong with that but you have to temper that with some analytical thinking. You have to have some strategy. We're not strategic. We react. There's a lot of reaction going on. Yes, you had a comment. I was going to make another comment. Is that after Azerbaijan was aggressive, right away they declared ceasefire. Mm. They attacked and they declared ceasefire, mm -hmm. and they did not intend to. So that was a, another lie that they did. So the whole world looked at it as, hey, 
they, they would not be aggressors, they want to cease fire, but they really would be aggressors. Do you think it's intellectually lazy of the rest of the world to just take things like that at face value? They just don't want to deal with it. They don't want to deal with the Armenian issue. Oh, okay, it's a ceasefire. <laughs> Fine. I want to go on to I want to go on to the next topic. Let's talk about which bathrooms our kids are going to use because that's the big topic we're supposed to talk it's about. Really significant. Right. Uh, didn't Hitler say that? Uh, I'm so lucky that people do not think. When I say something, they believe it. How do people make decisions? Donald Trump knows how people make decisions. We make decisions intuitively. We're the ones who survived the most by being intuitive. If there's something in the jungle, the bushes are moving, are you going to stand there and say, Vasken, get the measuring tape. I want to measure this uh, tiger, see if it's a big tiger. You're not going to do that. You know what you're going to do? You're going to run. Intuitive, the pattern. Someone got eaten by something in the jungle the other day. I don't care what it is, I'm running the pattern. We're intuitive thinkers, that's how people make decisions, and leaders know that. If they're smart, they know people make decisions intuitively. So Trump can get up and say, people coming across the border, that those strangers coming across the border, they're a rapist, you know, we don't have rapists here. What are we doing in all these other countries? How many bombs, how much ordinance are we dropping in other countries? We set up. I mean, I don't want to get too political, but you know where ISIS comes from. Okay, at least we have some very good theories. So, again, it's the spin. It's the way things are spun. These are all related. It's storytelling. Which story are you going to believe? Which story do you want to believe? Now, when we're looking at tribalism and its older cousin, nationalism, or actually older cousin would be tribalism, nationalism comes from that. They're all kind of related to each other. The in-group, the out-group. And then religious, organized religion, I'm not talking about spirituality, which is a connection between people, but like organized religion, that's like state religion, for example. Also related to hunting parties. We're all gonna go out hunting. But that group is also hunting. Our people are hungry. Their people are also hungry. There's not that many animals. So we have to find a reason why we all relate together and work together good so we can hunt more animals and compete with them. They might even attack our village. You see where all this comes from. It actually comes from a place of survival. You want power over your own survival. You don't just want to give up your survival to someone else. And as Armenians, we've been learning this lesson very painfully. We've been relying on the big powers. We're relying on other people. Please call it a genocide. Okay, great. They, they did. But that doesn't change the, the thing on the ground in Arapa. It doesn't change what's happening right now in Aleppo. It doesn't. Zulnestin that's why I'm saying that whatever I'm talking about, it could relate to a much wider American audience. Obviously, this is a topic everybody's dealing with. But on a very specific level, for our little hunting party, for our little tribe, this is a huge issue. This could wipe us out in, in something basically from the memory of the world because our kids, our next generation, they're buying into another narrative. There's also different truths like transcendent truths. Now, obviously, I'm using religious symbols. It could be anything. It could be philosophies. And no, I don't believe philosophy is dead. I think that when someone says philosophy is dead, um, they're making a philosophical statement. But I really do appreciate people being very honest about themselves and saying, yes, we all have a particular philosophy that we approach the world with. Some is similar, some isn't. But also, a lot of the sources of conflict come from these, the pursuit of these transcendent truths because they appeal to us on a very, very emotional level. It's pretty much, here's the way I listen to it. Someone said, when you argue with someone, which is happening a lot these days, especially over Facebook, the, whole, the worst place you can talk to anybody about anything important. But anyway, I'm, I'm seriously, show me your hands. Anyone ever try to argue with somebody about something important on Facebook? Okay, how rewarding was that? Especially a controversial topic. Seriously? They have machikan nuts. You know what it's like? It's like playing chess with a pigeon. Because as soon as you start winning, the pigeon's going to flap their wings and destroy it. You're not going to get anywhere. These are things that are so deep. They're such a part of our being that, you know, it's really hard to discuss in a very cold environment. But they also cause a lot of conflict, but they can also bring people together. Okay? 
So every religion, every philosophy has this very spiritual side, which is the, you know, I'm connected to everyone, and a very tribal, we have our own hunting party, this is our tribal Jesus, our tribal Muhammad, our tribal Buddha, and Buddhists also do it. And even, you know, our little atheistic group, whatever it is, we're different than this other group. We have the right to survive. Our genes have a right to survive. Theirs don't. We're also what I call the opinion nation, opinion nation. Basically, opinion making is very democratized right now. You can get on any one of these things and state opinions, have an opinion about what's important, what other people should be reading, what photos they should be looking at. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm saying this is a mechanism that's changing the discourse big time. And also wording games, we talked about that, news, news media, and uh, you know how all these different news outlets are um, changing the conversation. Who's behind these people? I'm not talking about a big conspiracy, there, but there are lots of little conspiracies because it's lots of different people who want to make money, they want to influence, they want to be able to change the narrative, the course of the nation, politicians and journalists that they know, influence, etc., etc. This is nothing new. This is, I'm not saying anything that's crazy. One thing I will talk about, though, is very subtle. Look at the way the BBC talks about uh, Armenian genocide. What does it do when it says, prints the word Armenian genocide? What does it have around it? Quotation marks. That's why I have quotation marks around the BBC. For me, anytime I use the word BBC, it's going to have quotation marks around it. Because they're not really a news reporting outlet, if that's what they're doing. They're not being honest. They're trying to play the game of being you know, egalitarian. But think about it. They're really thinking about their own interests. Because the UK doesn't want to recognize the genocide, because the UK has interests in not recognizing the genocide, just like the United States does, as a State Department. Okay? I want to bring something else up there. I talked to you about House of Cards. What do you think about news commentators, like, for example, in this case, Wolf Blitzer and this other guy, whatever his name, Ooh, what's the name of the other guy? I forgot it. Okay, John King. Here they are in a scene from House of Cards. House of Cards is a fiction. It's really well written, very enjoyable. I have it on the side when I'm usually working. Uh, that's also a new phenomenon, by the way. People used to put headphones on and listen to music, right? Well, before that, they put a record on in the office. Right? So people would get angry and argue with each other, like, <clears throat> And then, then people started bringing out the Sony Walkman, so people used to put the headphones on, listen to whatever they wanted, and then it's iPods and so on, and now on their computers, usually they have a really large monitor or two monitors. On one side, they have a TV show kind of playing in the background. Look, you get used to it. What I do, I work on movies. So when I'm having something play on the side with good music and like a good soundtrack and good acting, you get that energy. While you're working, it inspires you, right? You get caught up in it. But while I'm watching House of Cards, okay, that's the thing I'm kind of binging on now, um, I see these two suddenly appear. They're talking about this fictional election. It's not a real one. Movie Mechka Lagos. But it's supposed to be CNN. All right, is it just me? Or am I looking at CNN and these people and I'm saying, maybe you were always acting. Maybe we're never going to get an honest read out of these people. I mean, do you see that? Because you're watching this show, not only are you watching CNN for real, reporting the news, but you're also watching them report the news in something that you're emotionally engaging with. It's a fictional news, but you're buying it. I talked to you about computers, but also now people are going to start wearing those goggles, virtual reality. People are going to start experiencing reality in such a hyper-real situation. This next generation is going to have trouble telling reality from, from reality. And in fact, people have talked about that. I don't know if you guys have read about people who've actually spent a lot of time with the virtual reality goggles. They're getting better and better. And now you can actually stand in the room. They've got the goggles that the software will allow you to mark out the room. So if you have to use this, like you're wearing this thing, you think you're actually walking around this castle, or you think you're actually walking around whatever it is. Pretty soon you're going to be able to run, you're going to be able to jump, you're going to be able to exercise while having these goggles on. Your real life, once you take those goggles off, is going to be so boring compared to what you're experiencing. There have even been some serious projects of virtuality that won awards. One was a guy went to the refugee camp in Syria. I don't think I saw that. 
He used 3D stereoscopic virtual reality to make a serious documentary. He didn't make porn. He didn't make a video game. This is a real thing that's going on. These are these kids that are going through a lot of stuff in a Syrian refugee camp. It got an award. And when you wear it and you watch this, the reality, like you're there, like you're in this room with these kids, and they're not doing much. There's no guns shooting, and the dad walks in and overacts. And there's nothing like that. Guys, this is Iraq but now you're a voyeur and a participant. You don't think that's going to affect your behavior? Definitely. In this case, good. It makes you care about things. But what about other things? What about if you're playing a video game and they put things in there to alter your behavior? It's not that hard to do because you walk away having been... How many of you guys have seen the movie um, Fast and Furious? Okay. Or any movie, James Bond, whatever. Something like the action movie. You walk out of the theater and you get in your car. Do you notice there's a slight difference in the way you're driving? Come on, let's be honest here. I notice it. Listen, even if I'm not driving faster, I'm more alert. I've just experienced hyper-reality and I've stepped into my regular life. So, bottom line is the invention of the new narrative. No bakuchumagabak narrative. They're telling people a story, okay? Ideas have power if you believe in them. If somebody is sitting there looking at um, a book, I'm going to pick up a book right now, and I'm going to go, yeah, war gods, it's all make-believe, it's all fiction. Do you think that book is going to have any effect on me? If I'm not emotionally connected to something, do you think that's going to have any effect on me? If you as a scientist or an engineer or a scholar are not passionate about that thing that you're studying, are you going to do good in it? Not at all. You need to be passionately, emotionally connected to something, even if it's analytical. You need to be passionate. So, obviously, ideas have power if you believe in them. It's called the suspension of disbelief. You can't watch a movie unless you have that. You won't get anything out of it. Big entertainment is in the business. They're in the business of making money. Yes, they make art, and there's artists that they use to do this work. But big entertainment is about making money. That's why Disney is spending four billion dollars or four and a half billion dollars buying Star Wars from George Lucas. It's not buying Star Wars from George Lucas for four and a half billion dollars because people at Disney are going, I want to create art. <laughs> They're saying, we want to make lots of money. How do you make lots of money? You get lots of people to go to see the movie in the theater and you sell lots of merchandise. You need people to passionately believe these stories when they go to see this movie. If the movie makes you forget for two hours reality and gives you this new reality, then it's successful. You'll walk away saying, that was a good movie. If a movie is just reminding you of your regular life, it's like watching a camera in your own house, in your living room. Mega panga lavago, akuska lavago, or mega nani and baragabor. I mean, it's not, you don't go to movies for that, you go to movies to escape. And again, think about it. Think of how you would be manipulated through this. Very subtly. Think how you'd be influenced. Think of what happens when they take a bottle of water, Kirkland or Coca-Cola, and they put it in the scene. So George Clooney, who we like a lot because of what he's doing for the Armenians, is sitting there in the scene talking to Julia Roberts, and he's like, Oh yeah, a Coke. I'm going to drink a Coke while I'm talking to you. You think it's accidental that Coke's in that seat? Okay. This is, this is the business of selling. And now they're getting so good at knowing what you like. They're getting so good at targeting you. So the industry in 2014, they're talking, oh, we didn't make as much money. They made half a trillion dollars in 2014. That's just in the United States. That's not worldwide. That's the entertainment industry. Half a trillion dollars. Making lots of people up, people making lots of money. And people have noticed. Okay. So, when we talk about, in this context, we talk about a voice. We talk about us as a small people having a voice. There's nothing wrong with being a little tribal and asserting your claim and having your individuality. That's why you're here today. You're not here because of what I believe. You're here, and I say this at different lectures, and I'll say this again. You're here because of what you believe. What you believe brought you here, not what I believe. I happen to believe something similar, so that attracted you to come and sit down and listen to what this guy with a hat has to say. 
but it's because of what you believe. And what you believe is important. Because you're a part of one of these little spheres, think of them as little tribes. The big tribe in the United States of America will be healthy when it's made up of healthy, little, happy tribes. So that's really the issue. Also, this is something that's hitting a lot of our young people. I know you guys all think the Kardashians are a perfect representation in Armenian culture, right? Am I correct? Yeah. Are you proud? That, so, yeah, they have, had, they have had an effect on getting the news out there about the 100 year anniversary of the genocide and so on, but your life is being outsourced. You're not living your life anymore. You're watching other people live your life. Okay? So basically, pop culture and the way people see us, this is a car accident in Glendale. In fact, I saw a car accident in Glendale today, a really bad one, off on uh, La Crescenta Avenue. Car, one of the cars went into a house, the other car was completely wrecked. Glendale has one of the highest, if not the highest, car insurance rates in, in uh, California and in the United States. Why is that? Reckless driving. Reckless driving? What's going on? Is it the way Glendale's designed? <laughs> they design it to kill people? What's going on with these young people with the crazy driving? But it is a stereotype. I'm in the film industry. I'm all the way in New Zealand. People talk to me about this stuff. They've all heard it. They've all heard about Glendale. They've all heard about Glendale Armenians. I'm not putting down my own people. I love my people. I don't think, I think there's lots of culture groups that have lots of issues. But what I'm talking about is the stereotype, the image of the Armenian in today's world culture. Very conveniently, you're handing people a very negative image. And this is, the facts speak louder than the belief. This is just a fact. There's tons of accidents, tons of reckless driving, and I've seen it in front of my eyes. My kid and I almost got run over once in front of her school because some genius was trying to get away from a Glendale policeman by driving his Mercedes downhill at 90 miles an hour. Ends up in a house. Young kid. And his parents come out and they're arguing with a cop. <laughs> whatever. Okay, look. I'm not, again, I'm not bagging on my own people, but again, zoom this thing, shit up, blessing. So obviously that's, that's part of the cultural paradigm we're putting forward. Also, another way we see ourselves, since we were kids, is as victims. Armenian genocide, we're victims. We grow up feeling of victims. This is especially true the more away from Armenia you get, and uh, Dikran talked about this at, at his uh, presentation. Where, where people in Armenia and Hayastan are actually thinking about other issues that are very current and pressing, but as a diaspora, what links us together is this idea of our shared trauma. But this is how we're raised. From since I was a kid, I've seen these pictures. We're also very aware of the thug nature of part of our, the way our culture is seen. The Armenian power, Armenian mafia, the Armenian mob. Other countries have mobs and mafias and stuff as well. But for Hollywood, this is a very potent and ready-made boogeyman. And they keep using this boogeyman again and again. Terrorists, mafia, you know, crooks. In fact, I wrote about that. I did a whole research. If you go on, go on my uh, Fugitive Studios blog, which you can find on our website, I have a whole article written about it that actually appeared in Yerevan Magazine. You guys remember Yerevan Magazine? When I was writing this for Yerevan Magazine, I wasn't, holding, I wasn't pulling any punches. I actually wrote a very serious article, but you know, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong, but the editor at Yerevan Magazine told me I should make it more positive. So I had to spin it. I had to change it a little bit. I had to edit it so it was, yes, we're being portrayed as, you know, uh, you know, Pezevang and, you know, uh, animal molesters and whatever, mafia, whatever it is. But that's okay because eventually Armenians are going to be seen in a better light. But what I've done is actually, you know, I've followed the way in uh, Hollywood films, Armen in the Hollywood entertainment media, um, Armenians have been portrayed from the very beginning. In the very beginning, yes, we're not known, we're exotic, but there was a lot of respect. There was a lot of respect for Armenians, and these characters appeared, they were not necessarily, you know, terrorists and, and mafia. Uh, down there at the, the bottom right is a movie called America, America, which is done by Ilya Kazan, it's in black and white, it's his favorite movie. And Ilya Kazan said that himself. And it's a story, a real story, about his 
uncle. And how his uncle came to America. Of course, all his uncle's friends are Armenian. So he's showing what's happening to the Armenians right before the young Turks took power. All the abuses under the previous Sultan, Sultan Abdul Hamid. It's all right there. This is a Hollywood mainstream movie. And done really well. So Hollywood definitely knows about Armenians. But as we get closer and closer to our present day, they're choosing to look at Armenians as a convenient bad guy. Uh, House of Cards, on the left, a character, Armenian power. The Darbinian family. I don't know if you guys watch that. It's the, one of the mafia families. It's, it happens again and again. S.H.I.E.L.D., Dragnet, all these different shows. They all got to have Armenian mobsters in there. Um, top, I think you guys have seen that movie. It's the one with Sophia Loren. Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. That's Omar Sharif. He plays uh, King Sohamas. Hmm? He's the Armenian king, King Sohamas. But what does he do? He attacks, but what does he do? Like, he's a traitor. He's siding with the Pan, Romans, and then Sophia Loren in the pots, and then he turns and he makes a deal with the Persians against Pan. So he's a bit of a... But still, at least he's a king, right? And of course, uh, Woody Allen's movie, Everything You Want About Sex But We're Afraid to Ask, not Gene Wilder, but the other character, he's an Armenian guy from Hayastan or whatever, and he's in love with his sheep. Okay, and I've heard that a few times, believe me. I guess, oh, you're being crude. No, no, I've actually heard that in Hollywood. They, they do the joke, oh, you're Armenian, ha, ah, sheep. When I went to New Zealand, they were like, oh, yeah, you're going because there's a lot of sheep there. No, it's true. Like, stereotypes are out there. They exist. Even people who are liberal and well-meaning inadvertently play into these stereotypes. We haven't represented ourselves well. And obviously on the right, that cartoon character is Principal Skinner from uh, uh, The Simpsons, but his real name is Armin Tamzarian in the story. So apparently what had happened is this Armin Tamzarian character, him, had taken Principal Skinner's identity when he thought the other guy was dead. I actually met Armin Tamzarian, who's an actual attorney, who's now a judge, and he told me that the writer lived in his building and basically saw his name on the, on the letterhead or something and thought it was a cool name. So they were looking for something exotic. And so they chose an Armenian name because it's exotic. And I've heard this before too, you know, uh, the exotic Armenian name. Uh, you guys listen to those like uh, old radio shows, you know, the old sci-fi, whatever they used to be on the radio. Sometimes there'd be a character with a long name, even an alien, like a Martian would have a long name and the other character would go, what is he, Armenian? You know. <laughs> So basically looking at all these stereotypes, I decided I wanted to change the way that Armenian culture is seen and we see ourselves. So I wanted something more heroic, and that's why um, I, I created the East of Byzantium franchise, because I wanted us to see ourselves this way and I wanted other people to see ourselves this way. I wanted to change the paradigm. Instead of sitting there complaining about it, I wanted to do something about it. So East of Byzantium is the story of Gregory the Illuminator and King Durtat but also, 150 years later, transfers over to the story of Bartan. And you can see the artwork basically is different than a lot of the artwork that I do for Hollywood. It's basically graphic novel, sequential images. This is from the first one, this is from War Gods. But telling a story, frame by frame. It's one of the oldest forms of storytelling there is, sequential pictures. Because I know our next generation is visual. And I think that they have to look at things visually. And again, you can see the different epic story that I want to tell people, and I want people to experience. In fact, the art style is built in a way that allows you, it's a bit rough, this is the way I do it. I first draw and lay it out, then I do a color Bible, because the color gets an emotion. It also keeps as much of the original pencil drawing in it as possible, so it looks rough. And then I do the final. I want that rough feel because I don't want it to be polished. Because the rougher it is, the more you as an audience member or as a reader will feel connected to the, to the story. When talking about color bible and color manipulation, when you watch a movie, they're manipulating you because of color as well. It's a whole post-production process. They will pull every frame, every sequence into the computer if, as they spit it out, and they will color code sequences. What you're watching is an animated film that basically, I think in science fiction, you can tell by the colors, this is what it would look like if you put all the shots of the movie end to end together and step back. So you can see how the emotions of the movie change because of the color. But you know, in a movie you don't mind being manipulated. It's a little manipulation. You're going to enjoy yourself. And the more better it manipulates you, the better you enjoy yourself. So 
So again, I wanted to leave you with images of the way maybe that as Armenians we can look at ourselves in the middle of, let's find this truth within ourselves, which is a heroic people and, and, and uh, you know, a people worth surviving, part of the kaleidoscope, the mosaic of world cultures that's had a heroic past that deserves to tell its stories. These are shots from Armenia again. This is the East of Zenji project, which is now in post-production. It's being edited. So, thank you for... Um, I had some movies to show you, but I could tell it's getting late for some of you. Um, you can definitely get on my website and watch everything that I was about to show you anyway. So, I want to take a few questions if you have them. We can turn the lights back on so people wake up a little. And uh, it's okay, I'm very tired too, but... I want to end with uh, a quote from Winston Churchill. Why? Because he used to have Armenian brandy every night. Okay, it's true. So he said, now this is not the end, it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And that's how I will end my discussion. Thank you very much. Yes, time for questions. Yeah. You have a question? Yes, please. Uh, Gregory Kupelian, you gave us a fantastic panorama of um, filmmaking and how our emotions are influenced by various aspects of, of uh, fiction uh, to tell us about ourselves. The question I have about our Armenian heritage, the present and the future, how can we change this victim mentality that we have, this fight and and competition that we have within ourselves to weaken us, as you many times mentioned, and change that 